Well, let's pray, and then we'll jump into Genesis chapter 42. Father, we, uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, we can worship you now and from the morning to the evening, and, and one day there'll be 10,000 years more to continue to, to worship you. We pray that uh, you'd use your word and the life of Joseph, well, as you have already, to minister and teach and speak to our own hearts. What a critical issue of, of our lives, this need to forgive, this need for reconciliation. He's such a great model and example to us. And Lord, we're just trying to understand how did he do it and, uh, and glean what we can from this young man's life. And we pray that... Uh, well, sees his brothers again, and we pray that you teach us from your word that we might be different as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that by the time you leave, you all feel very guilty. Uh, because uh, the, uh, if you do, it's because the grace of God is on you. We don't often think of, of guilt in a positive sense. But uh, without it, none of us would have ever come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's what leads, we hope, to a godly sorrow Paul tells us a godly sorrow leads to repentance, to salvation, leaves no regrets. And uh, I think as Christians, sometimes we maybe do a better job in our relationship with the Lord in that issue than we do with other people. Most of the problems that we have in our life are a result of the fact that we live in a fallen, sinful world. But it's also because of our own sin or the sin caused against us from someone else. Sometimes that's severe. Joseph well, it was pretty severe, right? His brothers sell him into slavery. I don't know if you'd be a little upset with your brothers over that, you know. But, uh, uh, yeah, my brother used to tease me. I kind of relate to Joseph. No, it's a little different when it's something that, that severe. I, uh, I did made this confession in the first service. I might as well in the second. You know, it's tough preparing a message on guilt if you can't unload some of your own guilt. So I just, I just have to tell you now, on Saturday afternoons when I'm in the Kasasa Academy... I usually have breakfast late. I don't eat lunch. I'm running the, your study notes off. I know that Trisha's got snacks for the kids, and I've been stealing the snacks. So I just, <laughs> it's the M&M peanut. I just got to get a handful every Saturday. So I'm going to try to replace those stolen candy. You can go, oh, yeah, Pastor confessed to it's the thief right on Sunday morning. But I feel better, you know, because uh, that's my sin here. I want to show you a, uh, uh, a little more serious note, a video clip from the movie Courageous. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to see it, it's available on DVD. Great uh, Christian film, very well done, and uh, uh, built around the life of uh, four police officers, uh, their own struggles with their families, different things that are going on in their lives. Uh, and this is a conversation uh, between two of them dealing with this issue of guilt doesn't really help us if it's not brought then to a godly sorrow. Because then when our eyes are on God, then we can turn to him to have that guilt relieved. And that's what Joseph does here. I don't know if you've ever read the story of Joseph and just go, why is Joseph doing this stuff to his uh, older brother? So well, we're going we're gonna to look at it and, and, uh, and learn from it this morning. Well, it looks like in the first five verses, Jacob here gives a command. And again, just it's been a while. We've been focused on, jo on Joseph. Let's, let's remind ourselves who his brothers really are. Sons number two and three, Simeon and Levi, Levi, are mass murderers, right? They killed every guy in a, in, a, in a whole village. Number one son, Reuben, committed incest with his father's concubine in order to try to establish his own primacy over the other brothers, Make him the number one son. Uh, and again, all ten of them take a part in beating Joseph, throwing him into a pit, and selling him into slavery. Number four son, Judah, uh, ends up having a sexual relationship with his daughter-in-law while she's pretending to be a Canaanite prostitute. And uh, these are the four, <laughs> these are the brothers uh, of Joseph. So they're a, they're a pretty motley crew uh, that he's going to be engaged with. Uh, also keep in mind when we get to that point of that confrontation, one of his concerns is going to be, oh, is that me? Oh, I think it is. That, this is not the first time that it's happened. If it was one of my kids, I'd pick it up, but um, I'm, I'm going to let it go. Is that okay? Anyway, the... I'm uh, <laughs> going to work on that. But... Uh, <laughs> along with many other things. 
uh, but the whole thing, he's got to be wondering the whole time, what happened to Benjamin? Did you, Benjamin grow up, wear that same special coat? Because he would have received it at some point in time in his life as well. What did his brothers do to Benjamin? Did Benjamin, well, is he somewhere in Egypt as well? Is he a slave also? Or has he been murdered? I mean, what's really going on with these brothers? Have they changed? Is there any guilt? Is there any remorse? What's going on in their own hearts? But all sets, sets up as God sends them down to Egypt. Uh, verse 1 says, When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there's grain in Egypt, Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the first thing we want to note, well, it's the command. It comes from Jacob. It's caused by by God. So this, as we read before, the drought actually uh, is in all that part of the world. It's going to go on for a, a number of years. And we, we know and actually have uh, uh, carved figures of people from Canaan journeying to Egypt in a time of um, famine. It was the thing to do. It was the breadbasket of the world. And uh, <laughs> Jacob is basically saying, how about you boys getting off your backsides and Getting down there, basically, is what he's, he's saying here. My translation, of course. But God is the one that's causing this. Look at Psalm 105, verse 16. There, the psalmist writes uh, of this incident, Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Who caused the famine? Who took all the bread away? God did. Who sent Joseph down ahead of them? Uh, God did. And then in Acts chapter 7, that we've referred to it before, Stephen before the Sanhedrin, having to give it a defense for his faith in Jesus as the Messiah, uh, does a very uh, good thing. If you're Jewish in front of a Jewish crowd, you recite the history of the Jews, which they would all be very interested and very attentive in hearing. And he does that for a point. He mentions this incident as well in verse 9. He there says, and the patriarchs became envious, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But notice, but God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt in all his house. God causes the famine. God causes the circumstances that would order them down there. God caused them to be envious and have him be sold into slavery, but God was with him the entire time. We closed our message last week. We kind of outlined some things that we could learn from Joseph that might help us, and that was one of them. Not only was God with him, Joseph knew it, and Joseph acknowledged it all the time, all along. It was one of the ways that he's able to deal with all the circumstances around him being the only righteous person in the entire country. We quoted uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, that uh, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Uh, if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Except the fact that that Solomon writing is really not totally true because if you're a believer, God is always with you. He is the one that will pick you up. God was always with Joseph. So says Stephen here. But God is orchestrating a crisis, and it's for a reason. Secondly, the command would include an exception, but Jacob did not send Benjamin. Verse 4, lest some calamity befall him. Kind of like what happened to Joseph, if I want to bring that up again. You really have the sense as we go through this from Jacob, what he says here, what he's going to say later, is that, yeah, the brothers show up. Joseph's not with them. They've got that special coat. It's got some blood on it. And they're saying, yeah, we kind of think maybe he was attacked by some beast or something here because, uh, you know, here's his coat. Do you recognize it? Yeah, that's his coat. And, of course, uh, Jacob mourns. And he mourns over his son that he loves so much. <laughs> but there's got to be some point in time where he starts to think about, I send my son. He's out with the other ten sons who hate his guts. And then shows up and they say he's been killed. He has to wonder. And it seems like he believes 
They were responsible. They let him die. Whether it was at their hands, they could have done anything about it or not. He probably wonders about it all these years. But uh, he's certainly not going to send Benjamin at this point. But again, the command comes, but God is orchestrating the events. And this is kind of the heart of it then, verse 6 to 25, the confrontation with the brothers. Now, Joseph was governor over the land. And it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they, didn't rec they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dream which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, but your servant have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We're honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, no, but you've come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. In fact, the youngest is with our father today and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you, let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else. By the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house. But you, go and carry grain to the, uh, uh, for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. And we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again. And talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money back to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Well, quite a, quite a scene. Look at the, uh, the opportunity to confront them come as, as they bow down. Now, uh, again, uh, being, being Hebrews, being Jewish, they're... <laughs> They're not real thrilled with this concept of, uh, of bowing before this Egyptian Lord, but uh, uh, they really have no choice. And also consider the fact that uh, as uh, Joseph had instruct, instructed, there are many places where the grains are stored. There are officials over them. Uh, Joseph is running the whole show. He's usually probably not likely at one of these feeding centers himself, but he's there that day uh, when they approach Guys with beards, speaking in a Hebrew dialect, there's 10 of them, pretty sure I know who these guys are. And of course he sees them, recognizes them, although much older. Keep in mind, some of these guys are grandfathers now. Some of them are probably in their 60s. Jo Joseph is now uh, uh, 30 something himself. And uh, they do not recognize him. He is thoroughly Egyptian. So he's shaven, he looks like an Egyptian, he speaks like an Egyptian, uses a translator, smells like an Egyptian. Uh, they have no concept. It might have been weighing on their hearts as they traveled to, well, to Egypt, the place they sold Joseph. Would they see him? If they saw him, it'd be a guy in a field, probably weather beaten from the years of, of slavery. Maybe he would be working on a building. They might have been thinking, is he around? Is he down here somewhere? Is he still alive? But they're not looking for him to be the Lord over the land. And they do not want to bow before anyone. Some cultures, that's certainly very, very acceptable. You know, in Japan, of course, you, know, you bow when you greet everyone. And, and um, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. I can uh, 
you know, recognize the folks from Japan when they're, I see them at the shopping center or at Burger King or something, and all I've got to do is say some greeting to them and just even bow a slight, just a little bit, and I'm going to get the, the uh, proper response back. But that's, that's not true of a bunch of Jewish guys. Notice faces to the ground. This is not a bow. This is like get on your knees and put your face in the dirt, kind of a bow that they're doing to, to Joseph here. And that kind of begins uh, this entire uh, confrontation. Uh, Joseph secondly confronts them by accusing them of being, being spies. And it is amazing. Now, we just read from Stephen. Stephen says it's God that gave Joseph this wisdom. And he's a pretty smart guy. But as we go through this, actually what he's doing is absolutely brilliant. Because he wants to know, again, where is his brothers at? Are they still the hardened criminals that they were at one time? Have they killed the younger brother? What happened to him? What's going on? What's in their hearts? Joseph, again, forgave them a long time ago. You can forgive someone. It doesn't mean you'll actually ever be reconciled to them. For that to happen, there's got to be some kind of guilt on their part and a recognition. There's got to be some, you know, uh, some godly sorrow that comes upon them. Uh, there's got to be some repentance in order for reconciliation. Our part is to forgive. And at least to say to God that we're willing if he will work in our hearts. Now, again, uh, we read about the fact, we'll read about the fact that Joseph thrown in the pit when he got there wasn't like this supernatural guy saying, hey, no, no problem, guys, I got this. All things work together for good. Going to Egypt, uh, don't worry about it. No problem. No, he's, he's crying for his life. He's crying, crying bloody murder. You know, save me. You know, somebody help me here. We've also acknowledged that he does process all of this uh, and he trusts that God is with him. Everything's happening for a reason. And it's not only into the household of Potiphar, but later into the dungeon. Not only that, for two more years after he translates or interprets the dreams of the butler and the baker. He's an amazing young guy. Uh, but again, he believes that God is orchestrating the events uh, of his life. He accuses them brilliantly of, of being spies. Do they still hate him? Uh, and is there a way of ascertaining the truth? Though thirdly, he confronts them by demanding to see the younger brother. So in the midst of the inter interrogation, he remembers certainly he has to think about the two dreams. The first dream where all of his brothers would bow before him. And here he is in Egypt all the years later. There's his brothers. <laughs> They're all on their face in the dirt before him. But it's not the dream being fulfilled because there's someone missing. It was all of his brothers and there's only 10. Again, so where is Benjamin? And so he needs to find out. And so he begins to question about the younger brother. You're spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land, which we know from uh, our archaeological findings that uh, it was a big concern among the Egyptians. They had a lot of gold. They had a lot of gold. Uh, they had a lot of wealth uh, in, uh, in that part of the world. Uh, they had the grain. They had the storehouses. They had the food of the world. There was a lot that they needed to defend and what we also know, and it was well known then, if you were caught as a spy, you were immediately executed. So when he says, you're spies, he had their attention, right? Right there. He had their, uh, their attention. Notice in verse 12, uh, he, uh, they say, but he said, uh, he said to them, no, but you've come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. In fact, uh, the youngest is with our father today and no... And what is no more? Uh, if they were spies, they weren't very good ones. I mean, he just kind of accuses them a second time, and they just kind of spill every, everything that they know. But that is what he wanted to know. Uh, did they have a conscience? Uh, and was it coming alive? The other thing about this is interesting is what he's doing to them is what they did to him. Now, remember, they oppressed him all the time. He is oppressing them now. When he goes on that particular day to journey at the instructions of Jacob to find the brothers and see how they're doing, wearing that special coat, do you remember as he comes, what do they say to him? They call him the dreamer, and they say, have you come today to spy on us? So he accuses them. I think you're the spies. Interesting, he, he flips the whole thing around. He now oppresses them. He now accuses them of being uh, a spy. They threw him into a pit. He'll throw them into a prison 
for three days, just to give them a little time to, to think it over. Verse 16, and he says to them, just to turn up the heat a little bit, send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested, to see where there's any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them together in prison for three days. And they all know, of course, that Jacob's just going to be really thrilled at this. If one of them shows up and goes, oh, hey, Dad, good to see you again. I just need to take Benjamin because the guy who's holding the other guy's in prison. And, uh, but I think he's a good guy. I think he's a good guy. We just got to show up with Benjamin. It'll be okay. I'll just be leaving. No, no, it's not going to happen. And they know it's not going to happen. So they pretty much are thinking that... Uh, I better, we better be sending our prayers here or something because uh, you know, we're, we're in big trouble. This guy is going to execute us. There's no way we're going to get Benjamin down here. And it gets them all thinking. Again, one writer said <laughs> Joseph had brilliantly messed with their minds and their hearts. <laughs> and uh, and there had been a little going on in their hearts and minds for a number of years. He comes back and he stuns them with two things. First, he stuns them in verse 18 when he said, Then Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. And the word that he uses, Elohim, Ha Elohim. He uses the Hebrew name for God. You know, they're probably saying, well, amen. That's, that's the first good thing we've heard, heard in three days. This guy fears God. Uh, but that had to be shocking to them. There's no way they're putting this together that this is Joseph. But it certainly had to get them thinking about that God and where was he uh, at that moment. The second thing he does is he shocks them by saying, I tell you what I'm going to do. The famine is great. You need to get grain back to your family. So I'm going to let you all take it back to them except for one guy. I'll hold one. I'll let the other nine go. All you've got to do is now return later for more grain and with your younger brother. And if you can't produce him, then it's all over for, for Simeon. And, uh, and what he's doing here, again, is trying to see if they had any kind of a conscience. What would their reaction uh, be? The third thing, uh, and most importantly, the fourth thing about this is the confrontation. We see it does produce a guilty conscience. His strategy does work. Verse 21, then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, Joseph. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. And we would not hear, therefore, this distress it's come upon us. And of course, Joseph is uh, listening to all of this. And he notes a couple of things. They no longer refer to him as the dreamer. Now he's our brother. Reuben refers to him as the boy. Things are a little different. He also learns that Reuben was trying to save his life. Reuben was saying, don't do this. Uh, it's a mistake. He, he didn't know that before. He also learns that these macho, unfeeling brothers were not quite as hardened as they were uh, 17 years before that. In fact, they had heard his words. They heard everything he said. They heard his cries, and they remember it. And probably those words and his cries have echoed in their hearts and minds now for over a decade. And most importantly, they believed that the distress had rightfully come upon them. This is our fault. It's the guilt of grace. Grace had come upon them enough to recognize what they did was wrong. And they might have remembered the words of their great, 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 great grandfather who said this, whoever sheds the blood of man, by a man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. And that was Noah. And they certainly would have known those words. Again, true guilt is a grace because it brings the guilty to seek forgiveness uh, and to repent. Is there such a thing as unhealthy guilt? Sure. People use guilt to manipulate people all the time. Uh, children that go through a divorce uh, often feel guilty over it, feel that it was their fault. It's very common. That's, that's, not, a, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a godly guilt where you recognize that you're responsible for things that you've done in your life. Like the guy in the video clip, there then is a recognition and because it then is combined with a godly sorrow, then there's a God that I can cry out to to do something about my guilt. Verse 23 at the end, it says, they did not know that Joseph understood them for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. We've also talked about the typology of Joseph, how he makes a, a great picture 
or parallel or example of Jesus Christ himself. Betrayed by his brothers, becomes the savior of the world, looks upon the sins of others and now, and now weeps. And we think of those words in John of, of Jesus the same way. So again, moved by their expression of guilt and remorse, Joseph can't control himself. Uh, and, uh, and at this point, he brings a second test to them. Verse 24 at the end, then he returned to them, talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain to restore every man's money to a sack and to give provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Christendom, one of the early, I'm talking really early church leaders, wrote this about Joseph. He says, see how Joseph takes every means of putting fear into them so that on seeing Simeon's bonds, they may reveal whether they manifested any sympathy for their brother. You see, everything he does is to test their attitude out of his wish to discover if they had been like that in dealing with Benjamin. Joseph also had Simeon bound in front of them to test them carefully to see if they showed any signs of affection for them. In other words, are they going to look at Simeon and go, okay then, sorry bro, I uh, hope things work out here for the career in Egypt because we're not coming back, man. Are you kidding me? This guy kill all of us. You know, it's like, sorry. You know, th that was the brothers of 20 years ago, the mass murderers, right? I mean, it's like, hey, we, we, there's, a, there's a, you know, still 11 of us. So, hey, lose one more, not too bad. Uh, you know, those guys would have just been out of there, but that's not their attitudes. Uh, he binds his hands in front of them and he's watching, he's observing. Uh, what will they be like? How will they treat him? What will they say? What will be their response? Well, this gets us to uh, the third thing here, the difficult choice for Jacob and his sons to make, verse 26 to 38, as they head back. So they loaded their donkeys with the grain, departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money. And there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this? Notice that God has done to us. Verse 29, then they went to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us, took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father, one who is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your household and be gone. But bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies. But if you are honest men, I will grant your brother to you, and you may take trade in the land. Then it happened, as they emptied their sacks, that surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. When they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. So they returned to Jacob uh, in fear because they found money in one of the sacks. And uh, they're not thinking they won the lottery. Uh, in fact, they're probably thinking, great, now we're really being set up. He's going to accuse us not only of being spies, but of being thieves as well. But notice this very important line. What is this that God has done to us? Finally, for the first time in the entire narrative, the brothers mentioned God, and they mentioned him uh, by name. It's the turning point for them, because now we have this combination of a healthy, a godly guilt with a godly fear. They're getting close to know who to turn to to deal uh, with their lives. Fear is one thing. Godly fear comes from a sensing that a holy God is at the hand of your circumstances around you and often well often we don't make that connection 
often as Christians, we don't make that connection. Certainly people around us don't make that connection. It's interesting. In other parts of the world, they do. Uh, first trip that I was uh, in, uh, in India, I think it was the first trip or the second, there was a super uh, typhoon that hit Orissa. A uh, big country didn't bother uh, us where we were located, but it did tremendous destruction. The people that lived in that area, what was said in interviews on the newspaper uh, and on television and radio in that area, all reflected that the people in that area assumed that because that happened to them, it was so powerful, it had to be caused by God. And if it was caused by God, it had to be for a reason. They assumed the reason was this. The year before, when a missionary family who had been in India for a number of years was driving uh, down, the car, down the road to get supplies. The guy and his uh, couple of sons with him, uh, they were surrounded by a bunch of Hindu fanatics. What were they con so concerned about? They didn't like the idea that they worked in a leper colony where they ministered to the lepers and showed them the love of Jesus Christ uh, and led them to the Lord. That was the big thing that upset them that they did. So they surrounded the car, lit it on fire, and burned them to death. So now a year ago, when a super typhoon hits, they assume that it is so destructive, it's caused by God. And if it's caused by God, it's for a reason. And that reason must be because we sinned against the Christian God. Pretty good deduction for a bunch of guys uh, in, uh, in India. People here don't always make that connection. But that's the connection that these guys are making here. We have a guilt, and it's a guilt because we shed innocent blood. And we were warned by Noah, if you take a man's life because he's made in the image of God, you're going to have to pay it with your own. So now, when something happens to them as drastic as this, it must be because God is dealing with us. It's an important connection. So now they've got a, a godly a guilt with a godly sorrow, and now they have a fear of God. Now Solomon, of course, writing in Proverbs 1, 7, familiar passage, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And really what he's saying is he's going to lay out those 31 chapters to try to teach us how to be wise, how to live righteous lives before other people, how to make wise decisions. He says, first, you have to know that at the beginning of all knowledge and all understanding, if you're going to get anything, you have to fear God. If you don't fear God, then, then you're, none of these things are going to make sense to you. What does it mean to fear God? It means to be afraid. <laughs> it, it, we, we, we like, you know, say, yeah, it's a reverential fear, but it also means just to be afraid. You know, a lot of times, well, people aren't afraid of God. And they don't make that connection. Sometimes we don't either. But again, godly fear is a grace. Because the fear then knows who he needs to turn to to have that guilt taken away. Fear alone won't help us. Guilt alone uh, can actually be debilitating. But when we combine these things together, how do we do that? Well, it's God that's doing it. It's God's grace that brought guilt upon these brothers. It's God's grace that brought a sorrow over their hearts. It's God's grace that they saw what they've done ultimately is sinned against him. And if they're getting punishment, they deserve it. They're responsible. You think they're ready to get saved? <laughs> Something is about ready to change. This is a turning point in the lives of the mass murderers that we call the patriarchs, right? Uh, one, one writer put it this way, a godly fear is precisely what every child of God needs. Those who live with odd reverence find that God orders all their life to his glory and ultimately to his children's glory as well. The other thing to point out here, again, or to remind, is the fact that, yeah, God is working in their lives. God is working. He cares about Reuben. He cares about Simeon. He cares about Levi. He cares about all of them. He cares about Joseph. He cares about Jacob. He cares about this family. But there's something bigger going on. He's trying to save the world. And he's got to save this family if he's going to build a nation, if he's going to bring a king, if he's going to bring the Messiah. You know, often, you know, it's really not about me. You know, I'm so special, and I sure pray that God would treat me very specially, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, and God does love us, and we are special in his eyes. But guess what? God is very interested about all the people that are around us. 
all your neighbors, all your family, the people you work with, whether they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ or not. And they're probably not going to do that if you hate their guts. <laughs> they're probably not going to do that if you stay ticked off for the, for the next 20 years because they said something, did something, or whatever in your life. Again, we can often understand this concept to be rightly reconciled with God, and we're so thankful for it. But then he expects us then to take that same grace and be reconciled to those around us, especially when they don't deserve it. And again, we can forgive. That's our part. Can we be reconciled? Well, that's up to him and his grace working in their lives. But that's what we're seeing here. Remember that, of course, the classic amazing grace. John Newton penned these words, 1779. He says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. That's exactly what we're talking about with these guys. Grace teaches their heart to fear. And it's going to be grace that brings the relief to that fear as well. Well, the second thing is the report to Jacob and all that's happened. Uh, and uh, uh, we see there, but it's, uh, it's interesting. You know, they, uh, <laughs> they kind of... They don't want to make it too bad. Yes, some really bad stuff happened to us, Dad, but it's not that bad, you know, because, by the way, we need to take uh, Benjamin back down there again. So notice they, uh, they don't mention being in prison for three days. Probably don't need to mention this to Dad. I don't know if you're a kid and some, you're going to retell the story of what happened, but you're telling your brother, I had a brother, uh, we'd probably do this. Probably don't mention this part to Dad. <laughs> Yeah, you got hurt, you're bleeding. Uh, let's not mention that other part of how it happened, though, or whatever. But that's what these guys are doing here. Uh, they don't mention being in prison for, th for three days. Also, they don't mention that the Lord of the land threatened to execute all of us. You know, it's probably not going to help our case. Well, he's really a good guy, threatened to execute all of us. But, you know, you know, I think he was just a little upset at the time. I think it would really be fine if we take a So they kind of leave these things out. Uh, and then, of course, the discovery of the money in the sacks that don't help. They're all fearful now. Third thing, they're reminded of Joseph's death, and that's what uh, faces the dilemma. These sons are reminded by Jacob, the father of Joseph's death. Verse 35, then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And then J Jacob mentions this whole thing about bringing his gray hair uh, down to the grave. I'm sure he had plenty of gray, uh, gray hair at that point. He's certainly elderly. Uh, but his indication is, I've lived my whole life in sorrow up to this point because of the death of Jacob, or excuse me, of Joseph. And now you want to make it worse. Verse 36, and Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me. In other words, whose fault is this that I'm in this condition? It's those guys. You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are, are against me. Two things here. One, he's certainly saying, I'm pretty sure that Joseph is not here because it's your fault. And now Simeon is not here because it's your fault. And now you want me to entrust you with Benjamin. It's not going to happen. And what is he saying? It's all against me. God is against me. Now, I just want to tell you, I know it's never happened to anyone here, but most of the people in the first service, they've actually said this at one time to another, to God. It's all God's fault. I know no one here has ever, ever said that. <laughs> but we, we get to that place, don't we? When things are really bad, God, even you're against me. And that's Jacob at this point. Now, was God against Jacob? Absolutely not. God's working this whole thing out. God's going to save the whole family. God's going to get them down to Egypt. God's going to bring this reconciliation. But he's just not trusting the Lord right now. And there's a lot of times in life when it's very difficult to do that. I mentioned it before, but again, by the time we get there in chapter 5020, remember 5020? What you, meant, you, what you meant for evil, God meant for good and the saving of many lives. We try to help remember that by saying that uh, we hope to have 2020 vision so we can look around and see things clearly in terms of the circumstances of our lives. But it won't help us if we don't have 5020 vision. And that 5020 vision is a godly perspective, like Joseph had, to know whatever happened, God is with me. Whatever happens, 
God has a plan. In his case, whatever happens, God's given me two dreams that indicate to me I will see my family again. They will bow down before me. We will be reconciled again. And he has the promises made to his great-grandfather, Abraham, that they will be in the land. The land will be theirs. The Messiah will come through. He believes all of the promises of God. God's with them. God has a plan. I'm going to trust the word of God. That's Joseph. That's Joseph's formula. 50-20 vision. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. The brothers aren't quite there yet, but God in his grace is working in their lives. I just want to go kind of at the conclusion here of Paul's passage in 2 Corinthians 7, uh, 10, where he kind of, he brings the, these, both these ideas together. He says, for godly sorrow, that's what we're talking about, produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. The, uh, <coughs> the Corinthians weren't such a, a great, great, great group of guys either. <laughs> if you know anything about this thing about incest and some other things going on. Not the greatest church. It's kind of carnal. And uh, so Paul's writing them, trying to straighten them out, both of his letters and so forth. Uh, but he says the good thing is that now, in the, in the second writing of the letter, because he writes the first one, kind of exhorts them, gets a letter back that we apparently don't, don't have, and, and things are okay. So now he writes this one, what we call 2 Corinthians. And he says, man, he's praising God because a godly sorrow has come upon them. And what did that do? It produced in them repentance that leads to salvation. And certainly, that's what Joseph is hoping for as well. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, he just, one day he's doing what he does every day. Tremendous responsibility over the entire country. He shows up and boom, there's his 10 brothers. What do you say? You're spies. <laughs> it's, it's pretty brilliant. And, uh, and, and puts them in prison, you know, and then, and then listens. He has that opportunity to listen to their conversations. Again, we'd say Israel's patriarchs would never become choir boys. Always imperfect. But uh, they're changing at this point because of one guilt, their admission of guilt, an acceptance of responsibility that we all need to come to. Uh, again, a real guilt, a godly guilt, it leads to forgiveness. Fear, not just a fear of the unknown, but a godly fear, a realization that God is actually in control and actually afflicting them because they've never repented of their sins. And then a sorrow, a godly sorrow that paved the way for repentance. And that's what God wants to do in all of our lives as well. He wants to teach us through the life of Joseph, I think like no other character in the Bible. I don't know another story that we could learn so much about this issue of forgiveness. Is this a big issue? Uh, what does the New Testament say about bitterness? It's like a root. Uh, that's uh, in, in your heart. And the writer of Hebrews says about it, don't let anyone miss the grace of God because of, of bitterness. I like the Damien Kyle line that says, uh, bitterness has the shelf life of a Twinkie. Of course, you have to know what a Twinkie is to kind of get that maybe, but uh, it seems to be able to hang around. A lot of preservatives, you know. You can, some of those Twinkies have probably been on those shelves for 20 years, but uh, still there, but uh, still look the same. Uh, that's bitterness. Because somebody sinned against us, and we never forgave them. Will we be reconciled to them? By God's grace, working in them. But it's our part to at least say to God, I'm willing. Please work in my heart. Because I want to, well, like Joseph, to be able to be used by you. And to keep my sights on the fact that you're with me. You have a plan for me. Help me to trust your word and your promises. And have that 50-20 vision. Amen. Listen.